Content warning, this book is about an extremely abusive and disturbing romance. I promise I don't describe any of the worst stuff in it in detail, but just be warned there are moments where this book is really fun and there are moments where it's genuinely really heavy and disturbing. I do glaze over a lot of it, but I just wanted to say this at the beginning so that I don't catch anyone off guard with that kind of thing. So in this video, I will be recounting to you my experience of reading Tease by Trisha Paytas. Oh boy, was it one. So <laughs> I like to read like a physical book that you can hold in your hands and read on a page and not a screen whenever it's possible because I'm just 75 years old like that. With my garbage book reviews though, it's not always possible to find physical copies. Sometimes they're only available online. Sometimes you can't really get a physical copy without giving the author money. Sometimes the thing's been out of print for like 40 years and the only copies left are like $300 collector's items. In this case though, I now own this forever. I could obviously get rid of it. I could donate it to a thrift store or something, but I really don't. Genuinely, I think that I, I would just straight up burn this. I would just straight up throw this away or burn it before ever donating it. I would not want to inflict this on anybody else. What I'm trying to say is I got this used copy on Amazon. It's like a self-published print-on-demand situation, which means it's not like traditionally published by a publishing company with things like standards and editors. You can basically just key smash out whatever the hell you want and the self-publishing company will print out a copy of the book whenever somebody orders one. But like I said, this is a used copy. I did not pay, well, I did pay money for it, but not very much money and not to the original creator. So it's, it's fine. I can, I think I can live without that like $7. I'm sure a lot of people have clicked on this video because Trisha Paytas is in the title, but to be honest, she's not a creator that I have ever really kept up with, not a creator that I know very much about. I feel like every couple of months I just hear in the internet ether about something horrible that she's done or said and I'm like, hmm, well, okay. So because I don't know very much about her, this video isn't going to be a very personal attack. Like for example, the way that my Onision, my reviews of Onision's books were. Like she's not a creator that I have like a very personal dislike of. So I will be talking purely about the book. I will be enlightening you to the edifying literary wonders of teas. Obviously you can't entirely separate beef with the book with beef with the author, but I would like to have as little beef with the author as possible because I don't feel equipped to I don't feel equipped. Chapter one, call me Priscilla. Having now finished the book and looking back on this, like the name Priscilla is supposed to be sexy. And it <laughs> really just conjures up like a grandma offering you cookies. Like Priscilla is just like the frilliest, frumpiest name I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> anyway, call me Priscilla. College life is so boring. It's not all the way you might picture it. It's all work and no play. Sometimes I find myself wanting to quit and become a stripper. When I'm at work, I often daydream about becoming a stripper, making lots of money, getting attention from guys, pissing my parents off, but mostly, I wonder what my stripper name would be. It's Priscilla, by the way. <laughs> I can never think of the right stripper name. Candy, Conquest, Quirky. I like Quirky because it reminds me of oatmeal. Speaking of oatmeal, she actually is currently at work as a waitress, and the man at table seven has ordered oatmeal. Yes, this is a whole middle-aged man who shows up t in a fancy suit, he wears a fancy suit to a restaurant every day to eat his oatmeal in a restaurant because he is in love with the protagonist. He's deeply madly in love with her and will take any possible opportunity to monologue about how he wants to take her away from her life and marry her, okay? Also, you find out later, lots of comments to insert now that I finished this book. You find out later that he was paying like $10 for an oatmeal. <laughs> Obviously later we find out about like his mansions and his sports cars and all these things. But like what really fucking gets me <laughs> is that every single day he ate $10 oatmeal at a restaurant. So the protagonist, her name is Mary, by the way. She has this stalker who shows up to her work every single day and asks for her hand in marriage. But she's like, you know, I'm just not interested in any of that. Like, as if this is a minor inconvenience and not an actual stalker. Her stalker, his name is Preston, calls her a tease for evading all of his advances. Haha, <laughs> get it? Because the book is called Tease. Haha. <laughs> Mary is just not like other girls, you know? Her roommate is always telling her that she'd be so pretty if she ever dressed up and wore makeup. And her boss is like an uglier version of her who's like super mad that all the customers flirt with her all the time. But she's just not her fault that she's just naturally blonde and has huge boobs. It's just really hard being hot, you know? I've never even been to a strip club before. I'm a 19 year old girl and I've never set foot in one. Is that weird? No, I don't know any young person who would go to a strip club except maybe like as a joke once. I assume Trisha Paytas is like 30 
something. I, again, I really don't keep up with her, but like, so I guess, yeah, she's a little bit older than me, but I don't know anybody like who is 19 now, who is closer to my age, who w would ever set foot in a strip club besides as a joke. I feel like the stereotype is th that it's just all like sad old men. So Mary's college roommate, Gwen, and her boyfriend, Destiel. They love strip clubs, so it must be a totally normal thing to do. Mary gets back to her dorm room after work and walks in on Gwen and Destiel having sex, but don't worry. This is a completely normal occurrence, so they all just start having a conversation. I know we just were talking about how much they love strip clubs and how it's a totally normal thing for college students to do, but I actually know Gwen is, doesn't want her boyfriend Destiel looking at other naked women, so when Mary suggests that they go to a strip club that night, Gwen gets super mad and storms out to go to a frat party instead. Then when Gwen leaves, Destiel obviously tries to seduce Mary immediately because she's just so effortlessly seductive. And she's like totally not into it, but also he's like super hot and she totally is. And you know, she's nicknamed Virgin Mary and she never thinks about sex, ever, but also she totally does. The double thing going on here is really astounding. So the next day at work at the restaurant, Mary is outside in the parking lot on her lunch break and she briefly falls asleep only to wake up to table seven man having a fist fight in the parking lot. I need like, I need a shitty book bingo, like a bingo card or a drinking game or something. And I need unconsciousness as a plot device on it because why, 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 what is it about what is it about you people and <laughs> having characters fall unconscious at a very convenient time to move the scene along? Why is that so common? What happened, I ask, genuinely perplexed by this whole chain of events, which couldn't have transpired over more than a three minute time span? Just some boys trying to be all cool in front of their bros who took off running the minute I grabbed that F slur by his shirt. I look at him, still confused, mouth open. He closes it for me. <laughs> hot and says some guys were taking pictures in front of me where my head was down to make it look like I was blowing them on the street. Who even does that? Boys. This is exactly why I don't date, period. That is exactly what I tell Table 7 too. He laughs and says I should try dating men instead of boys. Like you, Mr. Williams, I whisper, fully intending to be flirtatious, as I'm still a little foggy from waking up. Preston, he bites back as if I've, of I've offended him. I shrug, whatever you want. Say that to me again. He looks me sternly in the eyes. Oh my fucking God. This man is like the oatmeal loving dollar store Christian Grey. And he's like, please, I will do anything. I will die. I will grovel at your feet if yo goddess. Oh, the, the most fantastic woman I have ever met titties. I, I will die if you let me take you on a date. And she's like, I can't tonight because I have a second job as a stripper, which she doesn't, by the way. She just feels possessed to say that. I can feel his disappointment in me. I suppose that's what it would be like if I really did become a stripper. Disappointed looks and shuns from random strangers. That also would mean that my dad and mom would be disappointed in me. They might start feeling guilty about how they raised me, which might be worth it. Okay, you're not gonna elaborate on that one? Just, just nothing? That's, that's just, that's okay. Cool, that's great. She goes back into work and immediately gets fired for flirting with the customers outside on her break, all because her boss is just so jealous of how hot she is and how the customers love her so much. Naturally, she gets extremely upset and anxious about this because she needs a job to pay for school and now she doesn't have one. So she goes back to her dorm room and finds Gwen and Destiel minding their own business, cuddling or something. And she's like, wow, you're, a ho you're not even gonna ask me what's wrong. You don't even care about me being dramatically upset in front of you. And her roommate Gwen is like, well, I will remind you that you left me for dead this morning in a puddle of my own puke after I got back from the frat party. I'm ignoring you because you left me in a puddle of puke a number of hours ago. Mary's like, well, sweaty, that was your own fault, so nobody cares. It's feel bad for me time. And when nobody indulges this, she decides to go sulk in the common area instead. This to me feels like the hallmark of a, a self-insert character, just the complete lack of self-awareness about when the protagonist is the one being the asshole. Like there's no, there's never any consequences. There never, there's never any growth. What can I say? This, it belongs in shitty book bingo too. Mary falls asleep again. Take a shot, everyone. She falls asleep again in the common area and wakes up to what? But Gwen grabbing her by the ponytail and smashing her head into the arm of the couch. Wake up, bestie. <laughs> Apparently, Destiel told Gwen that 
Mary was the one who tried to seduce him. And Gwen is like, well, I'm moving out. I hate you now. And Mary is like, oh my god, no, I lost my job and my dorm room in one day? Guys, I think Trisha Paytas thinks you have to pay rent on dorm rooms. Your roommate just randomly running away in university is like, the coolest thing ever. It's prepaid, you just get the room to yourself now. Nothing left to do, I guess, but become a stripper. That's it, that's the, that's the only option. It's time to become a stripper. When I enter the convenience store, I get some cat calls. I forgot I'm still wearing my work clothes. This is only on her way to become a stripper, by the way. This is still her restaurant uniform, which was quite revealing as well. Um, Cleavage really does make men stupid. One of them asks me how much, totally disgusted. I get my coffee and wait in line. I stare at the neon, open sign for a few minutes while my admirers continue to taunt me, saying I'm a hooker. I throw my hot coffee in his face and bolt for the exit. He and his friend run after me and grab me just as a police officer comes right through the door. Perfect timing. Is there a problem here? The cop questions, as if bored by the situation. The two men let go, and, and I leave. I walk a few blocks until I feel I'm a safe distance away from the convenience store and sit on a bus stop bench trying to figure out what to do. Part of me wants to run away, take a bus, and just go anywhere. I wish I had the balls for that. I also wish my mom hadn't been such a goddamn alcoholic while I was growing up. I think the idea of being a stripper is glamorous, but I always feel bad taking money from lonely men. Then again, lonely men are always taking away my self-worth and sense of safety just when I get go to get a cup of coffee, so maybe that's the universe's way of evening the score. Yeah, this book just really punches you in the face sometimes. So Mary walks into the strip club and is like, yes, hello, I have titty, I would like a job. My stripper name is Priscilla. She is hired immediately. Also, Preston is there, table seven guy, for the stalker guy, her stalker is there. Preston books a 30 minute VIP session with her, which she immediately assumes means giving him a blowjob and is about to do it and he's just like, whoa there, buddy, don't you know I'm a good Christian man who wants to marry you and or be your sugar daddy, it's really not quite clear. She actually does tell him off for being super fucking creepy and stalking her and then she immediately is like, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean that, that was way too harsh, I've just had a bad day, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to insult you and say mean things. No, no, you had it right the first time, you were completely correct to assert boundaries with this man. She then immediately gets fired from the stripper job too for being too afraid to go out on stage and also just having an argument instead of a 30 minute VIP session. <laughs> so she leaves and who is waiting for her outside the strip club but Preston. $10 oatmeal boy. Mm. And she's like, I'm so sorry, I asserted normal healthy boundaries with you, will you please forgive me, accept my apology? And he's like, no, you're right, I shouldn't have been creepy, I literally have a daughter older than you, but also want to get in my car. His car is super expensive and his house is like so fancy. They're at his house now. Lord help me. This book is described as erotica. That's what it says on the back. It says, in her first foray into erotica, best-selling author Trisha Payton, yeah. Don't read this book if you think it's gonna be funny, if you think it's gonna be bad knockoff Fifty Shades of Grey. Just, it's not. It's li literally just a graphic rape scene 20 pages in. That's, that's it. Like, I have no jokes. And you know that this man is still the love interest of the book. Just, like, the disconnect between what is being described on the page and how you're supposed to feel about it, I guess, is... It's just wild. My battery died and it took me like five days to get back to this, but don't, 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 never mind, it's fine. We're on to chapter three. Priscilla is becoming like her alter ego in a way. She keeps like her hot stripper alter ego. She keeps referring to things that Priscilla thinks or things that remind her of Priscilla. Her parents come visit her. She's kind of just anxious that they're gonna ask her about the money situation because she needs to pay her tuition soon. I've never been in control of my life, my diet, nothing. I admire that about Preston. He seized control and took what he wanted and look at the life he lives because of it. I need to take some control. Oh my God, go to therapy, please. That's not that, no, that should not be the takeaway here. And then she's like to her parents, don't worry about it. Sweaties, I got the money. One of her potential plans is to go rob Preston. So I'm, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that's the plan. I'm hoping that's the one we go through with. I like that plan. I wouldn't mind if she like, you know, kills him with an ice pick while she's at it or something. What was it? What did, what, what did she murder the rapist with in, in Satan Was a Lesbian? Was it an ice pick? I think, I think, I think it might've been. I'm trying to like sit. Gays don't know how to sit part 500. Literally every video of mine that's more than 20 minutes long, I, there's, I'm trying to sit at some point. Welcome to that part. Welcome to the gays can't sit interlude. Okay, so eventual plan is possibly to rob Preston, but it doesn't, that's, we're not quite there yet. Maybe he's still like the final boss or something. But first of all, she's gonna practice on Diesel. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop saying Destiel lest I taint the good name of Misha Collins. So she goes to Diesel and she's like, well, haven't you heard? No actually means yes. And I've wanted you this entire time. 
meet me at 10 p.m. tonight. So she convinces him that this is like a role play situation going on, but obviously when you're screaming for help, people are gonna come break down the door and see what's going on. So he gets arrested, and this is, this is fine and great because that means that she gets to steal his wallet and car keys that were left behind. Hashtag girl boss. And she's like, you know, I don't feel bad about it. I don't feel bad for him. His dad's a fancy lawyer. Frat boy types do this all the time and never face consequences. He's gonna be fine, obviously. I mean, yeah. This book really punches you in the face sometimes. That's the thing. Trisha Paytas has some things to say that could be really interesting and nuanced, but this book is a really weird vessel for them sometimes. I just feel like I get whiplash every time she makes a comment that's like interesting or true. Not that that makes it okay to frame frat boys for rape. It's not. That's, that, that's what I'm saying. That's my whole point. It's like the story is completely fucked on every level and it, and it just really takes away from these moments where you can tell that she does have thoughts and she does have an interesting life experience to kind of communicate whether that's through fiction. I know she's written some non-fiction books or like more autobiographical books. I think there would de those would probably have more value than this. Um, not that I've read them, not that I think that I will, maybe, maybe I will, who knows. But anyway, back to this horrible tale. That night Mary wakes up at three in the morning and who is in her dorm room in there, just he's just there. Preston, he's there, and he's the worst. Stephanie Meyer had no idea what she was doing when she unleashed Edward watching Bella sleep on the world. She had no idea what she'd started. Big shock, Preston has been watching her and stalking her around campus all day and also knows her parents' address and will murder them if she ever speaks to the police. I think we should all just have a moment to look into his eyes and feel better. Do you feel healed? Because I do. Chapter four, she uses the money she stole from Diesel to pay for her tuition and her dad calls her and tells her he's proud of her for paying her tuition. And she realizes that being praised by her father feels very good. And she realizes how that sounds. And she has a genuine moment of reflection on her intense daddy issues. Speaking of those daddy issues, she's still super into Preston, just dream man. She tries to call him, but oh no, she doesn't. She didn't do it. It was her stripper alter ego, Priscilla. I'm just... I'm, I'm so not equipped to unpack any of this. I'm just, I'm so not equipped for this. I think someone with a psych degree needs to take it from here. Actually, no, my, my roommate does have a psych degree and I, I wouldn't inflict this on her. I wouldn't inflict this on anyone. This belongs solely in my strange young's suffering chamber. Well, I guess now it belongs. It's gonna live rent free in all your brains now too, I guess, so. Just don't read it. Just don't, just don't. Please, I, I know I've done this for so many books I've reviewed before, but like, this is worse. There is stuff in here that is worse than in any Onision book. Don't read it! Okay, so we have a few months time skip. Our girl boss over here is making bank at her new career, which is, that's what she calls it, but that she's sleeping with men and robbing them. That's her career. She describes it as like, well, she's a hooker, but they don't know it, but they pay for it anyway. Hashtag quirky. And that's pretty crazy. So she gets a job at a diner, a normal job, just to have some, some balance in her life, you know? Everybody needs some balance. I love how this book started out. Like literally the first line of the book was talking about how hard and life consuming university is. And I don't even know what this bitch's degree is. I don't know what any of the classes she's been to are. I don't think she's done any schoolwork except for like vague references to needing to study. I would make an educated guess that Mary being a student is probably just like sprinkled in there as like a little fun fact to give her this like wholesome, hardworking, smart girl aesthetic, but then Trisha Paytas actually has no idea like what to say about what being a student is actually like, and it does just like, like you, you're gonna lose your dorm room if your roommate leaves, it just none of it makes any sense. <laughs> Not, nothing about her, this character being in school has any relation to the plot or makes any sense at all. Anyway, she's living her super normal life again now, but she still fantasizes about Preston all the time, even though it's been so long, and she knows she'll never meet another man as great as him, and is this book is this book fucking gaslighting me right now? Because like, <laughs> I read what I read, didn't I? Like, like I feel the need to like, did I hallucinate the whole first beginning of this? Like, I am literally being gaslit by this book right now. So one day who walks into the new diner that she's working at, but Preston, obviously. And who is he with? This one's actually a bit of a plot twist, but Mary's old boss, the one she's also named Mary, and she hated protagonist Mary for being prettier than her. That was, 
That was her whole thing, remember that? So apparently Preston and the other Mary are dating now and it's super awkward and protagonist Mary has to serve them at the diner and Preston is being like super quiet and awkward about it and not really acknowledging it. But the other Mary is openly hitting on protagonist Mary? What? So that's an experience that she has and then later that night when she's closing up the restaurant she hears a weird noise in the darkness and like every idiot in a horror movie who is about to get murdered she goes to investigate the mysterious noise in the darkness and who creeps out of the shadows and grabs her. Who do you think? Who, who, who do you think? It's Preston. Chapter 5 so he just like grabbed her and like pulled her into the darkness but also then he immediately lets go and is being super nice and polite and fatherly. Did I make gotta make sure I don't forget to mention fatherly and he's keeping his respectful distance from her which is still close enough to like creepily pet her hair. I don't yeah I don't know man and he's like I just want to protect you here's two hundred dollars and then he leaves. Turns out the mysterious noise in the darkness was um the other Mary who was very drunk and raving about exposing protagonist Mary for all of her crimes because she knows about all of her crimes now and is going to expose her because she hates her for being so effortlessly hot etc etc. What happens next I don't know how to describe to you not even for demonetization purposes just like for my own will to continue living but Protagonist Mary murders her, she murders the other Mary in a non-consensual act involving zip ties and a fork. She's dead now. Yes, we've been over the fact that the back cover says erotica on it. It sure says that and yet there is sex in this book, but I would really like to propose a genre change to horror. Obviously the protagonist of this book is a massive self-insert. There was a lot of Trisha Paytas's genuine thoughts and life experience put into this and you can tell that she's experienced a lot of abuse from men in her life and I'm not going to tell anybody how to deal with or reclaim their trauma but it I think it's pretty irresponsible to brand this book as erotica and slap this cover on it. Well kiss mark on the back this doesn't prepare you for what is in here like I don't think that like she shouldn't be allowed to write this I just think that the genuine issues here and there's a lot are dealt with really horribly in the context of this book and it should probably be branded better to communicate the intensely horrific and triggering material that is in it. Chapter 6 Mary wakes up the next day to the police knocking on her door because of course she does because she just left the body in her place of work and she's like why is this happening to me I could never kill anyone I'm so innocent I have no memory of where I was last night but I know that I'm innocent because I could never do anything like this haha ha, get it because Priscilla did it haha ha, yeah we get it. Preston shows up and tells the police that she was with him last night even though she wasn't well she doesn't remember but she wasn't so and even though he totally clearly knows that she did it he shows up and tells the police that she totally didn't do it and was with him last night and he's like you know Mary I just I think I want to get to know you better I think I want to take you out on a real date now. Would you like to get to know me Mary? I'd like to get to know you. Why? I hiss. <laughs> Okay, Ebony Darkness, because I think we're a lot alike, you and I. Oh shit. She takes her to his house and tells her about how much she reminds him of his daughters and then also also threatens her that, you know, he'll, he'll murder her and stuff if she ever crosses him, you know, just hashtag romantic things. You think I came in every day for that terrible oatmeal? I came in for you. You know nothing about me, I say flatly. You, I know more than you think. He has transformed from the sweetest guy into the creepiest in a matter of minutes. That's how I feel. That's it. Just now? Just, just now. Just now was when he got creepy. Okay. So anyway, then they fuck in the driveway in full view of all of the cars passing by and neighbors and confess that they are madly in love with each other. Then they have a beautiful romantic time together until 2 a.m. and she realizes she has class in the morning and she should probably get home and what happens next will not shock you. Preston is like, how dare you assume that you have bodily autonomy? You can't leave. She runs away and manages to escape though. So my prediction at this point in the reading process, and I really didn't know if this was gonna actually come through because a lot of the times when I've been reading books for my shitty book reviews I've been like, 
I've connected the dots. You didn't connect shit, but I've connected them. And then it turns out that there was there was no dots to connect because not a single brain cell was utilized in the writing process of the book. But my prediction at this point in my reading was that Preston was the one actually who told the other Mary about protagonist Mary's crimes, thus engineering the whole murder situation, forcing her to murder her and driving her into further insanity, thus gaining even more control over her life, ability to blackmail her with things, etc. It really makes sense, right? I mean, I was right to have no faith in this book. They never revealed that that, that, that was the case. But like that, that would have that would have worked, right? That would have been Trisha Paytas hire me as an editor. Speaking of the whole murder, the murder she committed, um, the cops are still they haven't really forgotten about that brutal murder that she committed. So they show up the next day to her dorm room and arrest her again, officially arrest her for the murder. When I go to meet my lawyer, part of me feels safe, and another part is scared shitless. You'd think it would be a surprise but it wasn't. What happens next will not shock you. Preston is my new court-appointed attorney. Mary, I told you what would happen if you crossed me. I can make all this go away for you right here, right now, if you'll just let me take care of you. I stare at him in disbelief. I didn't know whether I should trust him, but what choice do I have? Do I frighten you, Mary? I nod. He lowers his head in shame. If that's not my intention, I love you and want to take care of you. You, do <laughs> you don't have to work or go to school. I'll even meet your parents if you'd like. I like school, I choke out, trying to wrap my head around all of this. I can't have you in a place where I can't control the atmosphere. It's too risky. Look where you might end up in places like this. And then that's it. She's free. She, I guess he just asked the police really super nicely to let her go, and then they did. He takes her back to his house and leads her into this beautifully renovated basement dungeon just for her. It's even got the shampoo brand she uses. That's crazy. It's so romantic, right, guys? We love a basement dungeon. But okay, it's one of those rare moments where we get to give protagonist Mary some points. I I, re I was calling her protagonist Mary to distinguish her from the other Mary, and now I just keep calling her protagonist Mary, Mary, okay? <laughs> She's like, really, dude? The basement dungeon? And he's like, okay, but like, how am I supposed to explain you to my daughters and their mother? Like, they're divorced, they're not together, his daughters and ex-wife never show up in this book at all, but he's like, how am I supposed to explain you to them? Only solution's the basement dungeon. It's the only solution. Mary apparently possesses a spine and one, one, critical thinking brain cell on this page of the book and this page alone because she's not super keen on the idea of the basement dungeon, but maybe even that's giving her too much credit because it's phrased super weirdly, like, mm, really? That's like so unsexy that Preston is intimidated by the women in his life and has to put me in the basement dungeon because of it? Like, give this thing, give, give it, give it, give it to a professional. So Mary's like, um, yeah. Quick question about me living out the rest of my days in the basement dungeon. Parents, I have them. And Preston's like, that's no problem at all. I'll invite them over and charm them and we'll announce that we're getting married. Engagement? Question mark. I look down at my hand. Apparently he slipped a ring on my finger while I was sleeping. I don't even get a proposal. Why do you want to marry me? You already have me here forever. It wouldn't be right for us to continue our sexual relationship unless it's right in the eyes of God in the state of California, he says in a completely serious tone. Chapter 7. What happens next? actually will shock you. Well, it shocked me because it was actually completely sensible and realistic, which is that dinner with her parents goes horribly. They see what a weirdo he is and they take her home immediately. So Mary moves home. Some time passes. She gets a normal job again. She gets engaged to a very normal man, a med student named Brad. But it isn't long before she starts missing her one true love, Preston. So because she's so bored with her new normal life, she decides to go out and start seducing and robbing men again. But don't get it twisted or anything. She still hates sex and finds them all super boring. Jesus Christ, lady, take up knitting or something. Is this book Dollar Store Fifty Shades of Grey? Or on the other hand, is it a horror story about how young women are treated like sex objects to the extent that they internalize that and put up with insane abuse? Both? It's trying to be both and it's giving me a massive headache because the fucking double think necessary just... So one day, Mary's about to have sex with a guy on the floor of the handicapped bathroom stall of a strip club, as one does, and then she, w she turns around and she realizes that who is in the stall with her? Not that guy she thought she was gonna have sex with on the floor of the handicapped stall of the strip club bathroom, as one does, but Preston! And she's like, I'm not afraid of you anymore because you looked so scared when my dad showed up and saved me from you, I'm gonna fucking lose it. And Preston's like, well, I bet you're gross and have STDs now. Also, do you still love me though? And she's like, oh, yes, I still love you so much. Meanwhile, in 
the shit show, she's also seeing a married man named Carl. And every day he comes into her work. She works in an office as a, like a receptionist or something, I think they said. Every day, Carl comes into her work and they hook up on her lunch break because because nothing's sexier than a schedule. And then one day, because, because Carl is married, one day his wife comes in and shoots them both six times. I shit you not, it is just as abrupt as that on the page. One day, we're fooling around on my desk in broad daylight where anyone can walk in. And on that rainy afternoon in April, someone does. Carl's wife. Six gunshots are fired. Our bodies fall to the floor. <laughs> Literature. Chapter 8. Mary wakes up in the hospital and as soon as she opens her eyes, a nurse walks in and is like, oh good, great, you're awake because your husband is here to take you home right now. Obviously it's Preston who used his apparent supernatural powers to make the situation go away again, like he did with the murder charges. Also, he tricked Mary's parents into thinking that they want a European vacation, which was just paid for by him, and then just yeeted them off. Just, just yeeted them off so they can't, you know, have common sense in his vicinity anymore. She just gets up and gets in the car and goes back to his house with him. Did she get shot or not? It doesn't seem like it. It doesn't seem like she's hurt in any way, and I don't think they would just release a gunshot victim the second they wake up. But then why did she wake up in a hospital bed? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, I literally can't tell if she got shot. We pull up to the house I share with Brad, but he isn't home. That's her super boring, uncool med student fiance. Preston tells me to leave a note saying I'm leaving him and won't ever return. Are you kidnapping me again? I ask. No, Angel, I want you to be happy. Not a prisoner, but my equal, he says, holding my face in his hands. After I write the note to Brad, we get into Preston's car and drive for a while. Finally, we pull up into a house I don't recognize. There's a sold sign out front and the house is completely empty. Preston tells me this is our new home, fresh to both of us and neither his nor mine but ours. He says this is our new beginning. So a year passes and Preston is like super nice and great now and everything is so romantic and lovely and great and nothing is wrong and also her parents love him now and they're like wow that trip to Europe we coincidentally for no reason one was so cool and he's like that's great how about I buy you a house in Europe no not no country specifically just just Europe you know the country of Europe and they're like you know that sounds great thank you impartial third party who has no reason to want us to be far away and then one day while Preston is away doing the business. He's, he's on a business trip. He's doing business. We don't know what kind. A biz maybe he's doing business in Europe. Mary takes this opportunity to go make amends with her ex-fiance Brad. You know, she can't do it while Preston's around or else he might get jealous. So she goes to see Brad while Preston is doing the business. Leaving the house for the final time, this is the house that she used to live in with Brad, I can't help but think of what my life could have been if I had allowed myself to be happy. If I could just be content with good people in my life and accepting the good things that come my way. I'm seriously disturbed in the head. There's no question about that. And I can't have kids with Preston. In fact, I can never be a functioning person in society if I don't seek help. I decide to talk to Preston about it, especially now that our sexual desires seem to have transformed into something more traditional and socially acceptable. But before she can even begin to attempt working on her mental health, Preston comes home from his trip and is like, how many men did you seduce while I was gone? And throws her in the basement. This time she gets a dog though. She, get, she, gets a, she gets a dog with her in the basement. I made the horrible mistake of thinking too long about this. So this is a different house, but they, they moved into a new house. You remember that, right? New house for sale sign, fresh start, whatever. He was prepared, presumably at some point, before they moved into this house, or while they moved into the house, wouldn't you have noticed the construction? He took the time to build a basement dungeon in the new house. He was prepared for this moment. Also, the dog, the, how long was the dog down there? Like, he walks in, she's home first, and then he walks in and he throws her in the basement dungeon, meaning the basement dungeon was set up and the dog was in there this entire time while he was gone on his trip. Like, he was prepared. Did he plan this beforehand? How long was the dungeon there? How long was the dog there? I, the people in this book and their hobbies. I'm so concerned. She apparently manages to dig her way out of the basement dungeon. It doesn't really say how. It just says she claws her way out. I, I can't tell you what that means. <laughs> oh, I gotta read a passage on page eight. Gotta read a passage on page 86. Uh. This thing is only like 90 pages long, by the way. We're very close to the end. 
The ambulance takes me to the hospital so I can rest. After a few days, Preston, looking pale and thin, finally visits me. I'm going to release you, Priscilla, he says somberly. You're so special to me, but I don't deserve you, he continues. I know his pain. We're not good for each other. He tells me that he got in touch with Brad and that Brad's going to meet us and take me back with him. He says Brad loves me and I love him and he doesn't want to stand in the way of our happiness. He also asks me to come back to the house one last time to get my stuff and Kung Pao. That's what she named the dog, by the way, because it's a, it's a chow chow, so she... Yeah. When Preston and I pull up to the house, something seems amiss. The inside and the outside lights are all off, and Kung Pao is barking wildly. When we go down to my quarters, Kung Pao's barking grows louder, and I walk in to see Brad lying face down on the floor. I squeal and go straight to him. I feel his heart beating, and I'm so thankful he's alive. What did you do? I yell at Preston. You don't want me. If I can't have you, no one can, he says. And he draws out a gun. Preston, don't do this. Please don't do this. I'll be with you forever. I'll go anywhere you want. He walks over to me and kisses me. He says we'll both be in heaven tonight if it's God's will. What the fuck? She and this dog apparently have, like, this deep spiritual connection, and the dog wants to protect her from Preston, because apparently the dog fully knows what a gun is or something. <laughs> but anyway... I know that we have more than enough reason to cancel Trisha Paytas, but like, can we add the dog dies to that list? Like, he shoots the dog! I'm just, can I like... Now Mary goes into such a rage at this that she stabs Preston 20 times with her high heel, which in my opinion is like just such a girl boss way to murder someone. His penis is still erect. The nasty son of a bitch is getting off on this. He's still getting off on driving me insane. Looking at my heel, I realize it's go not going to cause him enough pain. Then I look at the gun on the floor and think I'd be letting him off too easy if I shot him. So you know what happens? Just... She bites his dick off and chews it up. Oh, would you look at that? Page 89. The police arrest me and put me in a mental ward. Sometimes I sit here and wonder if I was born crazy or if men made me this way. Maybe not even men, maybe society. We sure, we sure live in a society, don't we? Maybe stuck up bitches like Gwen who get whatever they want made me crazy. Why do movies and books glamorize sex when it really, when all it really does is ruin your life? Even the nurses and administrators try and get in my pants, knowing very well why I was put here. I don't ever want to get out of here. I'm scared of what I might do to myself. Today I'm getting interviewed for a documentary called Maneater based on my story. The interviewer walks in. He's middle-aged. I know what you're thinking. It's not Preston. Preston is... Actually, we don't know if he's dead. I know you can very easily die from blood loss if you lose your dick. I don't know where I heard that. Just a handy piece of information I absorbed from somewhere. You know, just, just praying for him to be dead from blood loss. Anyway, we're talking about this sexy middle-aged interviewer. His eyes are a deep chocolate brown with beautiful lashes, etc, etc. My lady parts perk up. You know when that happens? Ladies? Yeah, anyway. She fucks the interviewer. The end. That's the end of the book. So, what have we learned? <laughs> I would say that the book was aware of how deeply fucked up the subject matter was, but like, at times it honestly felt like, like especially the last passage to the end really kind of felt like a bit of a tacked on disclaimer, like actually it's fine because the murder porn was like a, a hashtag deep commentary on society the entire time. Was it though? Like was that necessary? Was, was that necessary to make a point? No. Was the, was the dog dying necessary, Trisha Paytas? No. This book is just so off the shits and so gratuitously violent that, in my opinion, it negates any potential for the book to be able to make some kind of commentary or criticism about society. That's just my opinion. I honestly feel like I could read Fifty Shades of Grey after this and it would read like 300, 400, however many pages Fifty Shades of Grey is. It would just read like cuddling to me. It would read like 300 pages of cuddling. Change my mind. Thanks for getting to the end, but also I'm so sorry that you got to the end. Like and subscribe to my YouTube channel and go support me over on Patreon. If you couldn't tell by my everything, I'm a horrible creature who still uses Tumblr, so if you want to be a creature with me, you can go send me some Anon hate over there, I don't know. But yeah, I will see you in a hopefully much less terrifying video next week. <laughs>